for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is the time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line Can hold it down. Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. Listen to the sick podcast. The eye test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy. The Stanley Cup winning Colorado Avalanche 
And after 22 years, Raymond Mark! The sickest NHL podcast. It's going to be sick. And welcome to another edition of the iTest on the Sick Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Murphy. He's Pierre McGuire. And we got another great episode in store for you. The Executive Vice President of Hockey Operations for the Montreal Canadiens, Jeff Gorton, will be joining us shortly. Uh, really looking forward to that. Obviously, lots of topics to talk about with the Montreal Canadiens. One of them, I'm sure, will be David Reinbacker, who is now in North America playing for the Laval Rocket. We'll get to that in a bit, Pierre. But Pierre, before we do that, some uh, really sad news. Actually, sad news this morning and now sad news uh, right before we come on here, coming across the wire. Uh, first, we'll start this morning. Uh, former Pittsburgh Penguin, who you knew, uh, Constantine Koltsov, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, yep. uh, was coaching the KHL, uh, died in Florida this morning. He was only 42 years old. And then within the last half hour, a lot of tweets going out right now from former teammates of his and people around the NHL wishing their condolences that uh, Chris Simon, former NHL or Stanley Cup champion with the 1996 Colorado Avalanche, uh, has passed away. Reports out there right now that he did take his own life. And Pierre, you know, it just it doesn't stop with this, with the, the former NHL enforcers that end up in this position that they're think, even thinking about this. And it's just... It's something we need to continue to pay attention to and, and do our best to prevent going forward. And uh, it's just tragic news, Pierre. First of all, Jimmy, we're all welcoming you back. We're so happy that you are back yeah. with us today. Uh, we were all thinking of you yesterday. I know on behalf of the show, we missed you significantly. So we're glad you're back and, and we're wishing you and your family all the best. You, this is tough news. Koltsov was a really talented kid. Uh, he was a first-round pick of the Penguins. He could really skate. He had some great offensive upside. For whatever reason, he could never really establish himself with consistency in the NHL. Those mm -hmm. were the tougher days in Pittsburgh, too, to be fair. is before the Crosby arrival, before the Malkin arrival, before the Latang arrival. So it was. It, there were some tough times there in Pittsburgh. The team wasn't really good, and I think that's probably something that affected him. He'd been coaching over in Ufa, which is a t club team that he played on, uh, Salavat Ufa, uh, which is a legendary program in the yeah. Russian League. Yep. And uh, I was actually there for the opening of the building back in 1990s – or no, wow. 2007. I'm dating myself. 2007, <laughs> the opening of the building. Um, and so, you know, watched, watched him play a lot in the NHL and watched him play in Europe and an immense talent. And obviously Chris Simon – Knew really well. Um, he was a big part of the Lindros trade with Forsberg, okay. Simon going to Quebec from Philadelphia. And, and uh, you know, Chris is tough. He's really tough. He was a great junior, by the way. He was a tremendous junior player with Sault Ste. Marie, just a tremendous, tremendous player. I know that he moved back to Wawa, which is right outside uh, Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, I know Teddy Nolan obviously did has done – so many great things in that community yes. up there. Um, but no, it's terrible news, tragic news on both fronts and uh, heavy heart today going into this because I was so excited to talk to, to Jeff Gordon. And I yeah. still am obviously, we still are. but, but this is, this is tough news. I mean, this is real. news. This is real. And, you know, I, I just want to say, and, you know, I, I'm sure it's touched us all and um, I'm unfortunately being touched by a little bit right now for people out there, you know, if, if you need someone, it's, there's so many outlets out there right now. If you're hurting, don't be afraid to speak up. Don't be afraid to confide in people, whether it's a stranger, whether it's someone close to you. Um, it, people are there for you. Don't ever forget that. Uh, you're not alone. Well said, Jimmy. Really well said. We're glad you're back. Uh, You'll yeah. never be alone on this show. <laughs> I appreciate that. Up, unless I can. By the way. Great interview yesterday with Mr. Randy Sexton. I, I listened to it after and um, really just insightful stuff from him, Pierre, and just um, kind of just the, throughout his career, what he's learned and how he's applied it and all the mentors he had. Um, and it was very interesting, too. And it seems like, I mean, is Scotty Bowman a mentor for everyone in the NHL? Because <laughs> it just seems like somehow, no matter what, all the people that succeed in this in this hockey world of ours have been touched by Scotty Bowen. 
you you have to be very fortunate to call him a friend and if you can call him a friend it, it does amazing things for your life yes it does amazing things for your career it really does yep um we talked yesterday morning you know we talk a lot you and i we were roommates jimmy and we won together so you know it's kind of there's a there's a family situation between both of us it's really bonding and tight but i love his takes i love how I love how he just cuts to the issue. You know, we were talking about when a player should leave college and when a player should stay in college. Mm -hmm. Not about when guys get rushed out of junior and when guys get pulled back and play a little bit more in the American Hockey League. So we were talking about that yesterday. I, you know, I mean, I'm going through it a little bit now, but we, we've made some decisions as a family too with our son. So it's kind of cool to see how it all plays out. Yeah. It's really cool. We'll see how it all it's out. amazing. And, you know, I thought Randy had a great quote on him too, Pierre. And I, I so, and you'll agree with it too. And I agree with it. And anyone that knows Scott, it's uh, lucky enough, like you said, to call him a friend. He's, he said, you got to listen no matter what when Scotty talks, because everything that comes out of his mouth is a nugget of gold. Yes. And, and I, I love that. That was a great saying. And it's true. And the other thing about Scotty too, is that, seen so many things change over the course of his time with the game and being connected to the game of hockey, but he he's very cognizant of what's going on in present times or what might even happen in the future. And he blends that with his opinion from his experiences, which I love, which Pierre, let's face it. Sometimes people are stuck in their own worlds and, and Scotty is still very open-minded and embraces everything and then formulates the opinion. Of course, that's what we try to do here on the eye test as well. So I've always respected that about Scotty. Think about this, Jimmy. He coached in the 60s, coached in the 70s, coached in the 80s, coached in the 90s. His last game was wow. against Carolina 2002. Yep. How many fingers am I holding up and thumb? <laughs> Five. Five decades. That doesn't count coaching whole Ottawa. That doesn't count coaching Montreal Junior Canadiens. That doesn't count all the scouting that he did. Uh, working for Sam Pollock and, and yep. working for the Canadians organization doesn't count him coaching in Peterborough. Like you start doing the math. Yeah. It, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And he never, okay. 90 years of age. I, I'm not afraid to say his age. And he, he probably takes pride in that, that he's 90 and he, he's so aware. Mm -hmm. He probably, I'm going to say this and I'm not trying to be mean or rude to the other managers in the league. I'm going to say if you put him in a room and say, let's play the game, name rosters of every team in the league, he comes in there at 90 with no notes, he clears out half the room probably within the first 10 minutes Yep, because they can't keep up to him. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. It really, and, is. It really and, is. You know, you do a great job here also applying what you've learned from him too, and I, I love that about you as well. Uh, and one man, I'm sure, I don't know if it was before he joined the Montreal Canadiens or – uh, or if it was after, uh, will be joining us. Uh, but he's he's had to have met Scotty Bowman, I'm guessing. So uh, Jeff Gorton, again, will be joining us here. And Pierre, you know, we were talking off air today, and I had, I've heard you talk on Melnick's show about I want to get his take on Rhinebacker too. And uh, a, a friend of ours, you met him the other day, Marco D'Amico, writes from yeah. Montreal Hockey Now, alerted me um, to bring this up with uh, Jeff that earlier today, Kent Hughes was saying that uh, they're going to reconsider uh, loaning or assigning players to their European teams and maybe just bring them over right away, considering on where Rhinebacker is right now, because maybe they think they'll just develop better that way. What's your take on that, Pierre? Every play is different, and I would love to hear what Jeff thinks, Gordon, but one size fits all doesn't work. It doesn't. Okay. Some guys need to stay there. Other guys have to come over. Um, you know, with goaltending, it's really a different thing, but I don't think one size fits all really works uh, when it comes to evaluating players, whether they should come out, whether they should stay over, whether they should come here and play in the American League. I, I think it, it, every player is different. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. Well, we will see. We'll ask Jeff on his take there, too, and then we'll look ahead because, I mean, I, it's that time now. I mean, Habs are clearly out of it, and everyone's starting to talk about the draft and what their strategy might be there. They could be a lottery pick again. Uh, so we'll get into that stuff as well. But before we do, and uh, he's going to be joining us shortly. Once we have him, we, oh, we have him now. So Pierre, I will ask you about it later. I want to talk about the GM meetings 
just some stuff coming out of there, but we'll hold that. Well, maybe we'll ask Jeff about it. We'll see if he's there. Uh, Jeff Gordon right now joining us, the executive VP hockey operations with the Montreal Canadiens, joining Jimmy Murphy and Pierre Maguire here. Jeff, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. And uh, are you in Florida? Are you with the team in Edmonton? I'm not in Florida. I wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't we all? <laughs> oh. It's oh. Did we lose the sound? I think we lost the sound. Once, yeah. We'll get it. He'll get it back. You intimidate Jimmy. You intimidated him when you said, "Are you in Florida?" <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. We'll talk to him. We'll get him back in a second. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, they're working on the technology there. Pierre, one thing I do want to ask him about too. I don't know if you saw uh, coaches' challenges now on uh, high sticking and puck over the glass. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, long overdue. I mean, I. You know, for a long time, I thought there were a lot of friendly fire high sticks that should have been allowed to be challenged. Um, puck over the glass, I think, is another one that really needs to be thought about. And, and my theory on offside is pretty simple. If you if the puck touches the top of the blue line, everything's onside. I really believe that once yeah. the puck touch, it'll, it would go, do away with so many of these needless video replays. It slow the game down and. You know, somebody that's got a lot of passion, not just for the NHL, but for all hockey, I think it's starting to trend downward to, to junior and to college and, and even to midget hockey, higher level midget hockey. It, it's a problem. Yeah, it, it is. So. It is. And it's it's the thing I just hate, Pierre. And I look, I, I want them to get it right and all that, but I'm with you too. Keep do it the way you said. And it's so frustrating when a goal is called back and it's, you know, 30 seconds later, sometimes even a minute, right? And it's it really had nothing to do with the goal. If it, it directly affects a goal, well, by all means, and I, I think the goal should be called back, but um, I, I just think that's one of the things we got to look at going forward is just don't let something that clearly has no effect on, on the outcome of a game become a factor in the outcome of the game. And I, I think that's something that I think they want to do there. Uh, we got Jeff, guys. Let's see. No, nope, we're waiting right now. Pierre, by the way, uh, as you were telling us before you got on with us, you are in Lake Placid. That's correct. How excited yeah. are you getting for the ECACs? I am. I'm getting ready. Um, I'm excited. Uh, Doug Christensen asked me to do that. He's a commissioner of the league. He asked me to do this back in December. First, the women's tournament, which I did two weeks yeah. ago, which was delightful. I had so much fun doing it. And then um, he said, hey, we'd like for you to do the men too. So, the men start on, on uh, Friday. I'll do their banquet on, on Thursday and interview a bunch of the players. It's it's just the players and the coaches. It's kind of a really cool banquet. And then, um, you know, we're all practices all day Thursday and a bunch of different media requests starting tomorrow. So it's exciting. I, you know what? It's near and dear to my heart. I played in the league. I coached in the league. Yep. I scouted the league. And my son plays in the league. So it's kind of a neat – I started in this league in 1979, Jimmy. There's a connection there for sure. There's a connection. Yeah, there's a connection. Part of you. That's part of you. I, right. I, left, I left my hair in some of those hockey helmets too, Jimmy. <laughs> All right. I think we got Jeff Gordon here. Let's pull him in. Is that better? Oh, much better, Jeff. I mean, uh, it's some of that hair of yours too. You're a handsome man, but we love your voice too, you know? I, know. I heard 1979, Pierre. That's, uh, you're aging yourself here. I just <laughs> tell the truth. That's all I do. <laughs> so you're, you're about to tell us now are you with the team in Edmonton are you home or no I'm home now I'm joining the team in Vancouver so okay great yeah. we're well, kind of uh, doing some stuff with the college free agents doing that and then uh, gotcha. join the team on the trip here nice I'm sure you'll be paying attention to all those conference tournaments when you can this uh this weekend as well huh yeah it's a great time of year I, I just heard the end of what Pierre was saying but uh, all those tournaments is fun to watch to see how it's you know, there's only so many spots left in that tournament now, as Pierre knows. So some yep. of those teams have to win or they're going home. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, just while we're on that note in college free agents, in your eyes, when did that really um, take a life of its own and really become a key factor in terms of hockey operations and, and you guys really having to scout them even better? 
Um, well, I, I feel like it's been there for a long time. Like I, I was listening to Mike Johnson the other day. I remember him being one, right? That we were all chasing. Yeah. All right. in green. All in green. Yeah, we had we had Randy Robitaille. If you remember back then, all when you green. signed when you signed guys, they jumped right in and they were getting full NHL pay. There was no two ways, right? So right, it's been, it's been around. I mean, if you can find them and good ones, it's uh, you know, it can give your organization quite a shot in the arm. And, and, you know, how much do you emphasize to your scouts to keep an eye on those players that maybe slip through the cracks but are still producing at the college level and, and potentially could make it in the NHL? Oh, uh, we, you know, we have a couple of people dedicated to just that. So that'll tell you, you know, yep. what we're up to and what most teams are doing, right? So you spend a lot of time watching them. You make sure they see you watching them because some guys like to be loved, you know? So <laughs> it's, uh, you know, some I feel like the, there's some guys that are better than others, right? You can tell what teams are, are doing it better than others. Yeah. So hopefully uh, we can attract some people to Montreal. You know, what's interesting about this, Jimmy, Jeff gets to see uh, Lane McDonald, or Lane McDonald, I'm dating myself again, Lane Hudson. He gets <laughs> to see Luke Tuck. He gets to see uh, Jacob Fowler. And he gets to watch his son Jack play at Boston University, even though Fowler's a PC. So it's kind of a cool thing. And I know one of the teams that does do it right is Boston University. What's your take, Jeff, on on where Lane is right now and where Luke is right now? Um, yeah, no, it's it's been a good experience to having a son there and uh, somebody that wants to be in hockey someday. So he gives me all the scoops. But uh, uh, <laughs> oh, listen, Lane, Lane. We'll start with him. He's uh, obviously last year burst on the scene and, and uh, you know, really good season. Um, but I find this year, I think those guys have done a really good job rounding out his game, right? So we know he has the offense. Uh, the potential to be that power play guy has always been there. But, uh, you know, those guys have him moving, up, moving the puck quicker, uh, defending. You saw in the World Junior, too, you know, I, I thought uh, they they did a really good job of, of – uh, uh, toning it down and having him on the ice a lot and defending really well, working on his game, and you know, a big part of that gold medal. Um, so we all know he has the offense, um, but he's smarter than a lot of people think, and he can defend way better than they think too. I agree. What about Tuck? Uh, Tucky's game is good too. Like he started off uh, the beginning of the year, he was with Celebrini, which was really good for him. Um, you know, since then they've evened out their lines a little better, and uh, he had a huge weekend. Um, He's been good. Like Luke's been pretty consistent, you know, we, of what we want, of, of what BU wants, you know, he's a big body player that uh, they're hard to find. Uh, he can really shoot the puck. He likes to go to the net. Uh, he's a physical player, uh, great kid, uh, motivated, works hard. So I find he's got better every year. Uh, last year playing in the world championships, I think for Quinny helped him a lot, right? He opened his eyes to think, Oh, you know what? I'm not that far away. And what about Jacob Fowler? Uh, he's, I mean, obviously impressive. He's, a, you know, their rival, and uh, maybe someone's going to be getting their way, right? But uh, <laughs> for him as a freshman to do what he's done um, is is pretty incredible. You know, there's not too many goalies that have come in and done that at BC, number one team in the country, uh, world junior. So uh, it's been impressive. Uh, you know, really happy for our scouting staff to – to to come up with that to to follow him and think so highly of him to take him where we did and um you know it's always nice when if, you know 12 months after you take him you're, you're looking and saying this is going to be a good one jimmy i just got to tell you one of the reasons why i asked jeff the qu questions the way i did because he's boots on the ground he's a worker like he goes to games he gets it so you got a lot of guys that do it but they take the words from their scouts and all. this man works it Mm -hmm. And so that's why when he tells me stuff that I see, I know he's spot on. So it's that's why I wanted him on the show today. For sure. Well, it is always, and you know this, Pierre, the best part, like everyone always says, what's the best part of being a general manager or being a hockey guy? It's, it's definitely the scouting, right? It's yeah, going it to the ring, seeing them live. I mean, we all have video now and, and Instat or whatever it is we're, we're following. Uh, you know, you can track analytics on players. But when you're in the rink and you're watching guys live and you see other people there, you, you, you kind of you get a feel for it. And that's, you know, I think that's the best part of, of being in hockey. And really when you're awesome. seeing a, a, a kid like Fowler, how impressive you, you were referencing it kind of there. But just his ability to almost play even better when the spotlight's on and when he's in a big moment. We've seen it in different situations so far. How impressed have you been in that respect? Well, I mean. When we drafted him, we, we uh, sat down with him in the suite after. 
he is the most talkative guy I think I've ever met. That's what it seems like, yeah. And he's got this, you know, the word now in hockey swagger, and he's got it right. And he wants to be, he wants to be the guy. He wants that limelight. Uh, so right away, when when we're going through the process with him talking about him, everybody talked about the personality and can handle it. The fact that he won, it was so. He was such a huge part of what they were doing in the USHL to win it all, right? So um, you always like goalies that have won, that have a track record of winning, right? Mm -hmm. Because in the end of the day, that's how we're all judged. And, and the fact that he was doing it at a level. So where he's come from in Florida, you know, driving two, three hours to, to practices and, and doing everything he did, a really committed kid, but a fun kid to be around. He's, he's, he's different, you know, he's a goalie. Definitely when you talk to him, you can tell he's a goalie. Jimmy, let me ask Jeff this question. You've been at it a long time. I've been at it a long time. Macklin Celebrini. Mm. I, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Jonathan Taves, which is what I've been telling Jimmy for a long time. I go way back with Jonathan. Yeah. What's your vision of him? I mean, I think you're pretty close. I've heard a lot of names. It's always when you're number one, you get that right. You get all the comparisons and who's he like. Um, but his skating is really, I mean, it's high-level skating too, you know. Uh, not that Taze wasn't, but he might have an extra gear of skating uh, mm -hmm. than, than Taze. And Taze was able to have the, an amazing career and be a winner and wherever he went too. So uh, that would be a, a really nice comparison for anybody, any hockey player to hear himself compared to him. But uh, super dynamic. His shot is is incredible. Got the one-timer. Um, <laughs> there's not much he can't do, you know, a 200-foot game. He's a pretty special kid. I mean, 30 goals, the amount of points he has uh, as a freshman. For the most part, he's been 17, right? So it's, it's pretty scary to think that. You know, there's some 25-year-old some kids in, in college hockey, right? It, it, Jimmy, just so to back Jeff up on this, yep. Ernie Kachuk had eight goals, eight yeah. goals, same age at BU. The next year he had 23 in the NHL. Wow. So Greeny's got 30. Think about that for a second. In college, I've watched him as yeah. probably as much as Jeff. Has. I'm just telling you, yeah. That one timer that Jeff talks about, Jimmy, he's a lefty on the right side. That thing is electrifying, yeah. It's crazy, it's amazing. Yeah. It There's, just, not much he can't do. There's not much he can't do, right? He's yeah. and he's a great kid, right? He's very, very humble. Um, obviously, his parents are in sports, his dad's a pretty successful guy, and yeah. he's been brought up the right way, and uh, you know. Obviously, you're going to have a long career, but for what he's done, you know, I think we expected him to be good, but this is above and beyond that. Um, Jeff, uh, early, I think it was earlier today. Somebody was just alerting me to it earlier in the day uh, that Kent Hughes was saying the inability to recall David Ryan back when you guys wanted might make you guys think twice about handing out your assignment clauses moving forward. What's your take on that? And also, how excited are you that he's over here now? Um, no, it's great. It's day one. He's, uh, only in Montreal would he have a scrum with, you know, a hundred people in front of him on day one. <laughs> right. And they're, you know, waiting for him in the airport yesterday. So, uh, I think God only in Montreal, him. maybe Toronto too, but, uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's great to finally get him over here. It's kind of a weird system, right? Where they were waiting and practicing for basically two weeks to see if they were going to play in a relegation. And it, right. and it turns out that they didn't have to. So good for us. Um, but I, I find with anybody, like if we can get you over early and get acclimated to, you know, the system, the organization, you know, next time when he comes over in training camp, he's going to he's gonna have a way better feel for it. So we're excited to get him. It's like I said, it's it was uh, it was a long year, right? His team, it, it just went south for them uh, pretty quickly. But, you know, he played a lot of minutes. And as far as that clause, like I. I'm okay with the clause. I, I, I never want them to come over Europeans until they're ready and they want to be here, right? You know, we, we, we make a lot of mistakes and we bring guys over when they they don't want to be here yet. I find that the best Europeans that come over is when they know they're ready to come and they, they're ready for it. They want to be there. So we, we don't want to force anything too much. Uh, you know, Kent's a lawyer, so he's, he's got some, you know, <laughs> he, 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 he would like to write as many things as he can to clauses into the contracts. <laughs> Jimmy, you see, I knew the hockey guy would back me up. <laughs> I knew he would. Good stuff. Having walked in his shoes a couple times. I mean, yeah. I remember when we had Marcus Naslin in 90, drafted in 91. Marcus just wasn't ready to come over. You know, he and Forsberg were amazing in Orange School. Go watch the tapes of it. It's crazy how good they were. But 
in 93 and 94, he was ready to come over, but he wasn't ready to come over in 91. I can tell you that right now. Yeah. And Jeff was probably at those World Juniors when he and, and Sundstrom and, and Forsberg just shredded teams. Like they were running scores up. It was moronic how much they were killing teams. But that helped him. And I think I wanted to ask Jeff this. If a player can dominate the World Junior, do mm -hmm. you not agree that he's ready to play in the NHL more times than not? I think for the most part, yes. I mean, if you could do it at that stage, you know, used to be at the dumb on the glass there and, and reporting it on, on all, right? So uh, that that's the high, that's, you know, almost the highest level you can do it at, right? Under the gun um, and dominate, you know, like Celebrini did, like some of these guys did. I, I definitely think it's a pretty good indicator that it might be time. I, I agree. I you mentioned Marcus Naslin. I, we had him at the end. He's one of the classiest people in hockey that I've ever agree. met. And totally agree. One of the few people ever I've seen like had a year left in his contract, making you know four million plus, and said, "You know what? I'm done. You know, use the money for something else. You know, pretty for, pretty pretty classy guy to do that." Yeah. You no, know, I'm just, Jimmy. Just to take it to another level to build off of Jeff's yeah. point because I I totally agree I didn't with know that. that. Yeah. Marcus called me up. And he had heard that my son was a pretty good young player. He says, Pierre, I'd love for you to come to Sweden this summer and work at the Orange School Vic hockey camp and bring your son, and we, we'll take care of everything. I was like, no, Marcus, I'll, I'll pay for that. He's like, no, no, I'll do it. Like, that's the kind of man he is. He's an amazing yeah. person. He really is. He's a truly great person. Yeah, very humble. That's great stuff. Jeff, take us back. Let's talk a little bit about you right now. We'll get back to the Canadians mm -hmm. in a second. But we all know your history with the Rangers, the Bruins before that. Um, but when, how did you first get going in hockey management or hockey ops and, and who were some of your mentors that really helped you along the way? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I went to, uh, you know, my path was really about, I wanted to be, you know, I didn't play at a high level. So the chance of being in hockey, I, I didn't really know how realistic that was going to be. Um, mm -hmm. So I went to, you know, I went to college and I was thinking about being a teacher and a coach and an athletic director type of type of person. And then when I was when I graduated from college, uh, there wasn't a lot of teaching jobs or anything like that. So I had an old coach tell me to go to grad school and separate myself from other people and see what happens. And I went to grad school at Springfield College Sport Management. And uh, towards the end, I did an internship for an entire year with the Bruins. Got lucky, yep. you know, my, my favorite team growing up. And uh, so I was in there doing everything, PR, whatever they asked me to do, pick up people at the airport, uh, you know, whatever they needed, right? I, I Deal with young reporters up. like me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, listen, I, you talk about the GM meetings. I remember, uh, I remember them calling me saying, hey, listen, uh, Harry Simmons coming in from the GM meetings. He's got no ride. I'm like, I'm going. I would pick him up and we, we would talk hockey for as long oh, as we that's, could. Like, that's smart. It was unbelievable. So that's how I got yeah. to know Harry really well and and let him know that you know hockey was my love and and that's what I wanted to do. But sort of evolved in there and then uh, you know uh, at the time Mike Milbury was there and he had left for BC and Mike O'Connell had come in um, and then Mike is a very forward thinking person. He doesn't get enough credit for being as smart as he is. Yeah, I um, agree. And he started adding and wanted to add to the department. And then, you know, luck came into, luck came to me and he's like, hey, listen, would you think about helping us with a video library, helping with arbitration, going to games? I used to take a video camera and shoot games at prep schools, um, all kinds of things. Um, so just that that luck of having Mike see, see the game that way, the way it was going. And then just, you know, never – I would, you know, my dad was a plumber, so he told me a long time ago, go get there first and stay there the latest. And that's basically, <laughs> the, that's the approach I use because, I, like I said, I, I didn't play at the highest level, right? I didn't play at college even, so I was very aware of that. And I even today, I'm very aware of that as, I, as, as we go out and build our teams. I have a lot of respect for players and what they have to go through. And, uh, and I don't ever want to slight uh, what, they've, what they've had to do to get where they are. So knowing that I didn't do that. So that's sort of my background. And then, uh, you know, just being in the right place at the right time. You know, Mike became the general manager. I became assistant GM. And then, and then uh, away we went. It seems like a very long time ago now, which is crazy. Um, you know, so was raising my family in Boston. And then things happened. Peter Charlie came in there, obviously, and, and made some changes. So I decided to leave there. And... Uh, Ended up with New York and and uh, luckily became general manager of the Rangers, which was quite a 
quite a thing. And, uh, you know, somehow I end up in the Montreal Canadiens, which is something I would have never thought would have ever happened in, in the, for a kid from Boston. So it's kind of, uh, kind of a, a weird background, but, but it's been fun too. No, it's a great one. I like what he said too, Pierre. It reminds me of you. Be there first and be the last to leave. I like that. Sure. Yeah, it matters. It matters a lot. You know, I mean, work habits matter. And uh, sometimes if you work a little harder, it can really help you. About, it's, especially in the evaluation of players. And I think just part of this, too, you go to a lot of practices. You watch a lot of kids. You can get intel. You get to the rink early. You talk to the trainers. They got a lot of intel. You talk to the assistant coaches that are boots on the ground breaking down the tapes. They got a lot of intel. So I think all that matters. And I know Jeff's gone through that very same process. Yeah, I mean, you sit in the scouting meetings early on, and you're you listen to guys. And you're like, all right, I, I respect these guys, but they don't know everything, right? Yeah. You know, like you know, there might be a chance for me here. So that's kind of <laughs> you just hang around long enough, and you and you listen, you learn. Listen, I, I spent uh, I spent more than a couple of years driving around with John Martell and Jerry Cheevers, going to games, oh, right? Yeah. Talking hockey with Hall of Fame people, uh, unbelievable. So you know, it's. Maybe it wasn't in the school that I learned the most. It was it was in the car or in the rink with those guys. Jimmy, one of the greatest people you'll ever meet, and I don't know how much time you spent. But I'm so glad Jeff brought it up, John Rattel. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, whether it was scouting or seeing him at the rink when I was coaching um, at the Old Garden in particular, I remember seeing him at prep school games, Jeff, and just the way he carried himself, the way he walked around, always nice to everybody, shake your hand, look you in the eyes, just an unbelievable man. The last time I spoke to him face-to-face -face was at the All-Star Game in Los Angeles, and I was there with Dave Keon Sr., Jean Rattel, and Scotty Bowman. Can you imagine? I just oh. sat there and listened. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Just well, be yeah. yeah, that's great. It's yeah. Good. John's yeah. special. John's he really special is. Guy. really a special person. I always, now I laugh with him when I talk to him because he used to – yeah, he used to make me laugh. Like I used to read his reports, get him in the computer and stuff. And he always used the word if he was a, if he didn't like the skating, he would call him awkward, you know. <laughs> right? uh, so now I, now I, now I said, John, I'm in Montreal. And I see some awkward skating, you know. <laughs> so I, I can say this so the francophone people don't get mad. Yeah. My wife is francophone, mm -hmm. and she doesn't say Atlanta. She says Atlanta, and mm -hmm. she doesn't say Ohio. She says Ohio. Yeah. So that's just to back up Mr. Rattel. Yeah. All right. What are we going to say, Jeff? We got these Boston accents. So, I mean, who are we to talk? <laughs> There's not much we can do with it, right? <laughs> it's it's high, right? I, I, I tell you, I remember too, a lot of times you compare Bergeron to Rattel, right? Patrice Bergeron? I, I did. I call yeah. him the, the young version of Jean Rattel. And okay. I still believe that. I don't know what Jeff thinks, but that's how I saw him. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good comparison, right? I mean, John, go look at his numbers. They're pretty scary, pretty consistent. Um, off the ice, pr pretty consistent, right? Um, so that's that's a good – that is a really good comparison. I, you know, Patrice is, uh, is special, special, special guy. And uh, they're both – I mean, I think I've used the word a few times on this thing. Humble is unbelievable. Oh, my God. Like John, John Rattel will never talk about himself. You couldn't get him to do it. No yeah. way. You just no never – you could never get him to do it, and uh, even if you gave him a glass of wine, he's not going to talk about himself. And, uh, and 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 Patrice is the same way. I mean, yeah. as soon as you see Patrice, he starts talking about you and your family. And, yeah, and doing it. yeah. Hey, Jimmy, to back that up, uh, I was doing one of the NHL awards out in Vegas. I forget the year. It's five thirty in the morning Pacific time, and I'm down in the gym working out, and I see this guy, but I. I only see the side of him. I don't see the whole body. And it's just me in the gym and this other person. And then he faced me. It's Patrice Bergeron. Wow. <laughs> Back him up. He goes, what are you doing here so early? He says, ah, I couldn't sleep. I always like to get there early, get it done. And he looks at me and he goes, how's your family? How's your son doing? Like, what's your yeah. daughter? Yeah, just yeah. like Jeff up. That's exactly what the guy's like. So he's crazy. a crazy guy. Crazy. Yeah. And by the way, you don't see uh, Ben to Vegas with a few teams. I don't see too many players in the gym. Yeah. yeah. Unless you at 5.30 in the morning. Not in Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of other places. <laughs> hey, Jeff, you know, before you got to Montreal, um, you were part of a rebuild with the Rangers there. And, you know, Pierre and I have discussed this before, how much we loved what you guys did, you know, writing that letter to the fans, letting everybody know what was coming, and this is how we're going to do it, and you laid it out there. How much did that experience help you when you took on the job you're doing now? 
Well, I think it helps me every day, right? It still still helps me, right? I have mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that happen there that are happening now, right? And uh, you know, when, as you, as you build a team, like Pierre knows, you, you're trying to build a, a team and, and 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 put people in these spots and and see if it works. You know, having that and knowing, you know, some of the deals we made, some of the players we brought into New York, and how it's worked out, and what kind of team they have. You know, it, it certainly gives me confidence. Uh, going forward to know that you know we we can we can handle it here in Montreal too. Yeah, are they and, doing it the right way, Jimmy? I mean, look at the depth on defense that they're adding. Yeah, look at the way their goaltending is coming along. I, I can't say enough good things about what Jeff uh, has obviously done with Kent and their scouting staff. There, the, the building pattern is is going to pay long term dividends for Canadians, I believe. But Jimmy, I really want to say this, and I do not want to embarrass Jeff. I was working with Kenny Albert mm -hmm. uh, right after the whole incident happened with Washington and the Rangers. And that led to, you know, Jeff and John Davidson no longer being there. And I can tell you right now, I called Jeff up right away and we got had lunch together. And mm -hmm. I, and Jeff, I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm just telling the facts, the truth. I think I had to pay. No, you did not. Okay. You got my club. Come on. Yeah, you're right. No, you did not pay. So anyways, uh, Jimmy, you need to know this. I, I've seen a lot of bad things happen in this league, a lot of real bad things. And usually mm -hmm. when bad things happen, people get really angry. I never saw a man take a really unfair thing and handle it with as much decorum as Jeff Gordon did. And I can tell you that from personal yeah. experience. I was blown away, Jeff. And that's something that I will always, always remember about you. And I tell people that story because it blows me away just how cordial, professional, and kind you were to talk about the way you talked about that. It was really, really impressive. Oh, I appreciate that. Listen, I, I loved working for the Rangers. It was, uh, it was one of the highlights of my career. My, you know, I was raising my family here when we moved down and uh, there's so many good memories. And uh, listen, I look at that team and I'm pretty proud of, of what they're doing today. Mm -hmm. uh, I still root for a lot of those guys. You know, I mean, uh, there's not too many nights where we look at the score sheet where I don't see a lot of the names that are pretty familiar. Right. So, um, it's it's hard to root against them, uh, except for a couple times a year when we play them. But you know, listen, being part of the Rangers and and uh, and how things are there and and uh, in New York City, it's you know it's a special time. And listen, getting let go and and uh, uh, for whatever reason is always hard. But uh, I, you know, I had a wise man once tell me. I think what did he say? He said, "If you." If you if you were still there, you couldn't be here. So that's how I look at things going forward. Right, hey, Jimmy. You know one of those players yeah. he's talking about? There's a guy named Fox. Oh, he's yeah. a pretty good player at Harvard. Now people forget drafted by Calgary, traded to Carolina. Somehow he ended up in New York. Yep. Yeah. I don't know how that happens, but that was good scouting by the Boston guy. Yeah. Well, I would hope that most people would even watching the show could find him, right? Uh, <laughs> but, I, but we had a lot of help. We had a lot of guys that had seen Adam. And obviously, Adam, you know, he grew up a Ranger fan. It certainly didn't help getting him to, to want to come. But, you know, I laugh. You do hear the stories, oh, Adam Fox wanted to be a Ranger. How hard could that have been? You know, he had Matt Cater as an agent. It wasn't that easy. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? He, also, he, also went to, he also went to Harvard and Boston and, and the, you know, the Islanders. There was other. There was a lot of other teams that saw saw Adam Fox, too. So, I, actually, that's one that kind of gets me when people say, oh, how hard was that? And Breadman, he wanted to go to New York. It's not that easy, right? No. It's just not, you know, people say, oh, if they wanted to come here, how hard was it? But it, it really wasn't that easy. But, no. listen. It always helps, you know, to get a player like Adam Fox to turn around your rebuild, right? That's, that's, and that's why I brought it up. And I want to give Jeff the credit and the props that he deserves on that. And I'm not – and listen, Jimmy, you know what I think of Lane Hudson. You know what I think yes. of him. I don't think it's fair, but I'm going to say this to Jeff now. There's a whole lot of Adam Fox and Lane Hudson. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of Adam Fox and Lane Hudson. Yeah, I think as we move forward, there are some players in the organization that we've acquired that I do see, like – you know, it's hard for me to, I'm not supposed to talk about other teams and the Rangers and stuff, but there are a few players we've acquired that I can see, you know, the blueprint, you know, kind of being somewhat similar as we move forward. And, yep. and certainly Hudson is one of them, right? So, you know, Doc is one of them. And, yep. and so 
a sort of a path that we're kind of running through, but you know, the kind of players you need. And uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully we're there. It's, it's, you know, listen, everyone says, uh, how long is it going to be? How, how long will this take? And uh, it's different. It's different everywhere. I, I feel like in New York, it didn't take that long, right? We, we went through a couple of tough years, uh, but we were on the come pretty good. Uh, we had the, you know, unfortunately we had COVID that slowed it down, but we still made that play in and, you know, we got swept by Carolina and then the following year, but things are really good. Things were happening there, you know, fairly quickly and getting the bread man Fox, some things turned that place around pretty quick. So, you know, we need some luck and uh, we need some really good scouting and uh, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. Just one more thing, Jimmy, cause I want to build off that goaltending mattered too. And you had to deal with, is Henrik Lundqvist still Henrik Lundqvist, or does Henrik Lundqvist need to move on? Yeah, you knew, and you knew you got those are hard decisions. We yeah. both had to make them, but the best one was you knew you had Shesterkin. Yeah, I mean, listen, yeah. if you remember, right, right? Igor was in the minors, and he was what twenty-one and one, and 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 doing great things. And the time was coming to get him right, and and uh, you know Henrik was uh, you know trying to trying to stay at that level and and uh you know so it's 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 never easy right a hall of fame player that uh, that someone else is trying to come for their job and you know maybe he's ready for it and maybe maybe it's time uh so you have a lot of conversations i mean you know I, it, it's never easy when you, nobody's ever gonna like it i've never traded a player that thanked me you know, or, or sent a guy down or told somebody that somebody might be better than. Him. So those are hard conversations. I, I always, my, my oldest son always says, well, you know, why do you do it? And my answer is always, well, if I don't do it, someone else is going to do it too. So <laughs> I, I guess that, that's how we can put our, our head on the pillow, right? Uh, you talked about the blueprint there, Jeff. And I'm just wondering from your Rangers experience and now just where you are now, um, when do you kind of know when you can start to you 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 build your young foundation, but when do you know that you can start to add in really high end veteran talent to what you're building, or is it just everything's unique and there's really no blueprint for that? Um, well, I think the team tells you right, like by the by the way we're playing. You know, I, I think uh, you know Kent and I spent a lot of time and Marty talking about when's the right time to 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 go that way. To maybe it's free agency, maybe it's a huge trade. I think you're always looking for something uh, to add. We're always looking to be better. We're always looking for a trade that would 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 be really helpful to to move this thing along. So, I don't know. I do think it's every place is unique. You know, I feel like in in uh, in New York, the bread man. He was a free agent. He did want to come to New York, right? He had history with 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 JD. There was a lot there going in our direction, right? And you get a player that gets 90, 100 points. Right, kind of helps your lineup move it forward, right? So, yep. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, those are the things you have to decide. And listen, it's not 100% unanimous. We got to get the bread man. It was like, hey, are we ready for this? We had a lot of conversations about that, you know. And uh, so, I think that's where we'll be this summer. Try to figure out, you know, who's there, who's out there to add. Those are the kind of things. But yeah, you're always looking. You know, we're very mindful of how hard it is to find skill. Right. Yeah. And uh, so we'll be, you know, we'll be looking for that. Are you, are you closer to that point than maybe you thought you would be at this point? Are you starting to feel it sort of arrive? Well, I mean, listen, I'd be, you know, I think I'd be, uh, I'd be naive to say when we got here, there wasn't more here than I thought. Right. So a lot of the guys that are pretty successful, like mm -hmm. Cole Caulfield, we didn't draft Cole Caulfield. Right. Uh, like Mark Bergevin did. Right. He, there's, there's a lot left here for us. So, I would be like, you know, I think I'd be selfish and ignorant to think that it's all us, right? So yep. there's some things here that were left, and, you know, we're trying to, you know, get the most out of the the guys who are here that, that are going to be really good players, and then we're trying to add to it. That's what we're doing. But are we for – I don't know. Listen, I, I feel like Nick Suzuki, to watch him every night, people, if they really dial into it, he's, he's a special player, right? Yeah. He's, his, his development to, to be a full 200-foot player – how good he really is. If you watch him night in and night, like I'm sure Pierre would 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 uh, add on. But special player, like right, Slavkovsky is starting to come. Right, uh, Gouli is is a really good good defenseman. Right, mm -hmm. Mike Matheson had a great year. Montembeau. There's a lot of good things happening. Josh Wall, we brought him up, and he looks like he could be an NHL player here for a while. So, 
there's a lot of good things happen. And then outside of the NHL, we have Ryan Backer who's coming over now and Mayu's doing well and some other things really excited happening. So I feel like the players can feel that and that's fueling us. I feel like we have the right coach for us that's, mm -hmm. that, that understands how to get guys better, understands the environment they need to be taught in. Um, he has a, a certain way of, of, of wanting us to play, and, and, and we all agree with it. So I feel like everything's going the right direction, and the time is coming. When that's coming, it's hard to say. But that is the number one question I get other than, how's my French coming? Right. <laughs> 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 Let me well, I get it. Like, I, we play in the golf tournaments every year, and I saw Pierre at the one last year. Yep. That, like, everyone's like, how was it? How were all the fans out there? What were they asking about this player? That player? They all want to know how my French is coming. Uh, <laughs> it's, well, it's coming like a typical 50-year-old Boston guy would be. It's coming as quick as Google Translate comes up yeah. right here. Right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. good stuff. Well, Jeff, listen, we appreciate you taking uh, the time. We know you're awesome. busy, man. And uh, we wish you the best going forward in the, with the draft coming up, another exciting draft with the position you guys will have. So uh, best of luck going forward. Give our best to Marty St. Louis as well, please, if you would. Will do. I will do. Anytime. You're such a good man. Thank you. Thank you. All That's right. Good stuff. All Jeff the best. Horton, join yeah. us here yeah. on the eye test on the sick podcast network. That was a good interview. I enjoyed that. He is, he's a great, what he was telling you about how he got to where he is Pierre and what he was doing. I came in right as sort of that whole process of starting with the Bruins. I started to cover the team and I remember him doing all those little things for the PR department and then doing stuff for the, the hockey ops department, all at the same time, he was little any, any job he could find to do for the Bruins, he would take it. So for everyone out there, you know, if you're thinking of getting in the same type of business, take his advice. You got to do anything you can to get there. And if you believe in yourself, you will. It's the humility and the kindness and the belief in his abilities. It's really helped propel him to where he is. And he also was never ashamed to listen, learn and ask questions. Um, and that's why so many times in this show, and now people probably get tired of it, you need to have mentors. Yep. You need to have people that can help steer you through their experiences to try to make you better. And if you're not receptive to that thought process, you're never going to get to the level that potentially you could. You yep. may think you have all the ability in the world. This is a really complicated business, hockey. Oh, really yeah. complicated. And, and when the Iron Curtain came down, Jimmy – Trust me, it became way more complicated. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the development of the, in Germany, and the, you look at Timmy Stutzla, uh, you look at Maurice Sider, you look. There, I mean, there's a lot of places where hockey players are coming from now. Yep. You know, Jacob Fowler's from Florida, Jimmy. You know, he's not from Sault Ste. Marie. He's not yeah. from Sudbury. He's not from North Bay. He's not from saint Javit, Quebec. He's from Florida. Yeah. You know, I, I can go down the line with all these players from non-traditional hockey markets. We need to understand. It's a very complicated business. It's right. Really complicated. It really is. The cap, especially with the cap. And, and too, like, you know, he said, and he's a perfect example, Pierre, and, and you've experienced it as well. I have too. You, you might be on a path and you might start to see, okay, I'm going there. And then all of a sudden, shh, that path is gone and you got to adapt. You have to adapt. That's that's another th key thing that I've learned here is, is adapting and understanding that the path you see in front of you isn't always going to be the path you end up taking and no. wind up at. Agreed. But I, I just, you know, it's interesting. When I texted Jeff yesterday, it wasn't like two hours later that he got back to me. He yeah. got back right away. I know. He said, Pierre, I'm traveling today but I'm free Tuesday and I'm free Thursday. And I said, how's tomorrow? He's like, boom, in. Okay, there's no ego. There's no arrogance. I'm not going to embarrass the people that we've texted together, you and I. Mm -hmm. And no, I'm too busy. Yeah. No, you're not. I, I did your job. No, you're not. I, yeah. I know why you don't want to come on because maybe you're not as good as some people think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that. And Unfortunately, we get some of those no's, but it is what it is. I'll tell you quickly, too, Pierre, when Tuka Rask uh, retired, the first guy that came to my mind, Jeff Gordon. Yeah. Why Tuka not? Rask wind up with the Bruins, if not okay. for Jeff Gordon. No. you Okay. 
So what people need to know, that was a bogey by Toronto, as you know. Yep. Um, and nature, just so everybody, this is, again, we don't rehearse this. There's no notes involved. Justin Pogge and Tuka Rask were owned by the Toronto Maple Leafs. Justin Pogge won the World Junior in 2006. But the goalie of the tournament in 2006 was Tuka Rask. Yeah. Toronto decided to make a deal with Boston for Andrew Raycroft. Yep. And so Tuka Rask ended up. So what Toronto did, they picked Pogge over Rask. Mm -hmm. It's an internal mistake. Yeah. It was an internal mistake. Yeah, and it that's happens. why it happens. It does happen. But that's why boots on the ground, eye test scouting matters. Exactly. And if Toronto had paid attention, I know the 06 Canadian team probably wasn't their best team ever, but there was a really young guy in that team that was really good. Mm -hmm. His name was Jonathan Taves. Yep. He was really good. He was a huge difference maker. Was Pogi good? Yeah, Pogi was good. Was he better than Rask? No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. And anybody that was at that tournament would tell you that, unless they were looking at numbers instead of looking at play. Yeah, exactly. And they probably were. And I had, you know, I brought, I did a story on it. I talked to Jeff for the story when he retired, and just the behind the scenes on what went on. And you know, we'll we'll talk about it another time because we're pressed for time now, Pierre. But it it was everything you just said. It was scouting every possible point that you could about a player, every possible thing you could, not just the player, but also the person too, and how he would fit in with your organization. And man, did they ever nail it. And, you know, there, there's people in Boston who, unfortunately, after Tim Thomas did what he did that year with the cup, just always wanted to could live up to that. And unless he won a Stanley Cup, he just wasn't going to be accepted, which I think is asinine. Yeah. But real hockey fans understand what an amazing goalie he was. He's the winningest goalie in the history of the Boston Bruins, one of the most prestigious organizations in not just hockey, but in professional sports. So for what he did is amazing, and that doesn't happen without Jeff Gordon. I don't have to say any more. You just carry the ball right across the goal line. Just don't spike it. Give it to the official. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it right over to our wonderful uh, fans here and viewers in the comments section. Let's open it up to questions right now. What do we got? Jeffrey B. Always bringing good ones. Gordon and Hughes have done an excellent job managing fan and player expectations in this rebuild so far. How much of fresh air is that for the Habs to have a staff with a plan they won't deviate from? I think that's a great point, Jeff. Pierre? Spectacular. Nailed. You know, I, there's some stuff I can say and stuff, some I can't. Yep. But I'll just say they're doing this the right way. They're and it's just, a hard market to do it in. It is. Very yeah. tough. That's so the, the number one... If, if you, somebody were to ask me, what's the one thing you have to do if you're going to run a team in Montreal? Don't deviate from what your beliefs are. Yep. You're going to get pushed. You're going to get prodded. You're going to get challenged. You're going to almost be bullied by the media. Don't mm -hmm. deviate from your beliefs. Never deviate from your beliefs. Exactly. Next question. RL, do you know what will happen this year with our European prospects like Angstrom, Kappen, et cetera? Will they come to Laval, Montreal soon? You, well, we heard Jeff say they're not going to rush guys to come over. They're going to come when they're ready. Come when they're ready. And like I said to Jimmy at the start, and, and I was so proud of Jeff because this, again, the show's not rehearsed. Yep. I told that to Jimmy. One size doesn't fit all. Some guys are ready. Like Kovalev was ready. When the Rangers brought Kovalev over, he was ready. Yep. Some guys aren't ready. You, you just take your time and let them simmer and brew, and eventually they'll be ready. Exactly. All right, next question. Marvin Matthews, curious about the hierarchy responsibilities. Does GM Hughes have to run decisions, trades, promotions, demotions by Gordon? I, I don't know necessarily, Pierre. You would probably know more. My take, just from the feel I get every time I talk to them personally or I see interviews with them or what I know from behind the scenes, is it's a, it's a very teamwork atmosphere. It's not necessarily, you know – the box stops here and that's the end all be all. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, Peter. No, it's a partnership. That's, that's you, the feeling I got. Yeah. Well, you know, Jeff let a little out of the bag in a good way. Kent's an attorney. So <laughs> his focus. That was a great quote, quote, by the way. Well, that was a great, but it was smart because yep. it's the truth. So he can do things that Jeff can't do. 
Yeah. And one of them is he he was an agent. He knows the value of each and every player. He knows how to negotiate a contract. But the biggest thing is he knows the bylaws of the league probably as well or better than anybody because he can digest less script is what it used to be called, the uh -huh. bylaws of the league. I've read it a million times. And back when I was doing it, you had less scripta and you also had the case study book. Now the case study book's been eliminated, but okay. I'm just telling you, it was complicated and you needed to have like a legal background to do this. Right. You don't have to have it as much, but I do think it's a partnership. They bounce ideas off of each other. Don't forget Rob Ramage is involved in this and don't mm -hmm. forget that Marty LaPointe's involved in this. Yep. So I think they're, they're really good at, at including everybody. It's an inclusive work environment, but I, I think, if for anything to get done there, those two guys have to be on the same page. I'm with you on that. And they seem to be, and they will be going forward, in my opinion. All right, next question. Killer Tomatoes, are Habs signing Tuck? I would say yes. Yes. But will. I would also say that um, he will be going to Laval. He's not He's not on a jet set to um, – nope. he's not on a jet set to Montreal right away. He's, he's going to be in the American League. Let him be overripe. Yeah, uh, overripe rather than underdeveloped. Exactly. All right, next question. Alex Evanoski, what do you think of Washington? Holding on to those two first-round picks back in 2019, 20, and 22 seemed to be paying off. Hey, I woke up today, and I knew they were coming, Pierre, but I still I was like, oh, my God, the Washington Capitals are in a wild-card spot. Kudos to them, man, and kudos to them – you, we talk about sticking with a plan. Kudos to McClellan right now for the job he's doing and not, you know, going for it all and knowing that he's still going to rebuild, but also giving this team enough to believe in themselves and to get it done and do what they're doing right now. I'm going to give a big pat on the back to Spencer Carberry. Oh, there were times this season where I thought he was struggling as a coach. He and his staff have reeled it in. They've done, And I watched a lot of their games, and he's reeled it in, and he deserves a lot of credit for that. That's, that's a young coach making hard decisions, which he's never had to make before. You know, when they traded away Anthony Mantha, that was one of their better offensive guys. Mm -hmm. He was. Um, but I told you at the time, I said, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> I, I would have traded him. Um, and he hadn't done much in Vegas yet, Mantha, has he? He hadn't done much. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think when they let Kuznetsov go, it opened up opportunities for a player like Henrik Lapierre. And so a young guy comes in, and it's this Branch Ricky line from the the Brooklyn Dodgers. Oh yeah, I prefer the nonchal. I prefer the enthusiasm of youth compared to the nonchalance of old age. Yep. And so they've got all these young guys filtering through their system now, who have won in Hershey, by the way. Mm -hmm. so that's where their AHL team, and now they're bringing all this enthusiasm. You see, it's kind of wearing off on Ovechkin. Yeah, he's getting enthused again. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, he's he's probably right as we speak, Pierre. This is the best hockey he's played all season, and you oh, can just, no, it is. It's that's a perfect description. He's enthused, and seeing that smile again is great. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. It's really good. It's good stuff. All right, next question. Mitch Balin, if you were GM in Montreal, would you trade the late first to make a splash at the draft here? Depends who is on the board, mm -hmm. uh, and it depends what I thought I could do. So a trade like that requires a lot of background work mm -hmm. so internally i would identify what's the one thing that could make us six to eight points better next year because yep. that's a lot of points oh yeah and so you know if you could find that player i think getting kirby doc back is going to help a lot yep um i i think obviously the improved play of uh you heard the coach talk or you heard jeff talk about it caden Gooley, he, he's really starting to mature um, which is really positive. Matheson's had a phenomenal year. Yeah. Uh, Jack guy's really starting to come after Marty punched him in the pants a little bit earlier this year when they sent him down. So there's a lot of positives there. You heard uh, Jeff talk about Logan Mayhew. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's going to be an NHL player for a long time. So it depends on what I could get to make my team six to eight points better. Here's one thing I would say, Jimmy, and I don't know how much people talk about this. Your coach – over the course of an NHL season, based on decisions, has to make a 10 to 12 point difference in a positive way. Mm -hmm. You're going to improve. If you don't have that, you're not going to get better, even if you add players. So that's kind of, 
I think this coaching staff can to, can do that when they have the right players, if you follow me. Yep, I'm with you on that. And Pierre, I'm going to ask a little question from Jimmy in the Village here. And it's a follow-up I wish I asked Jeff. When he was talking about the bread man, Panarin, wanting to come to play in New York, and obviously that made it a little easier to get him to sign there, we hear so many times, and you know, we all know the reasons why players – don't sign in Montreal, the taxes, what have you. And I, I'm wondering, Pierre, they're probably not going to get a player that wants to come there as much as somebody, as much as Panarin wanted to go to New York. And you, you're still, as, as we see, they're still building up their plan here right now. And it's a lot of youth there. How do you entice, a, I'm not going to say a, a Panarin caliber player, but a high-end caliber player, how do you entice him to come there right now and sell him on what you've done and what you're doing and where you're going if you're the GM here? Illustrate the professionalism of the Montreal Canadiens management team, coaching staff, and ownership. Illustrate just how great a city it actually is to live in. Mm -hmm. uh, illustrate that there are good schools, competent schools, if you've got young kids. Look, at I raised a young family there for eight mm -hmm. years. I lived – you know, I grew up in Montreal, but I left for a long time because of sports. I, I mean yeah. – from 1977 until I'm going to say close to 2000, I didn't live in Montreal. Right. You know, did I go back all the time to visit my mother? Yeah, I did. You know, or right. my dad who lived up north. But no, I mean, so for a long time I was gone, but I'd go back, but I didn't live there. Um, but I raised a family there, and there are schools that you can put your kids in, especially younger ones, where you're not going to be disappointed uh, academically. You're not. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to illustrate that. The, one of the things I would do if I were in Montreal, and I think they're trying to get there, I'd build almost a recruiting department, not 10 people, one or two. Mm -hmm. And their responsibility is to sell the role of the player within the organization, the dollar value that the player can accumulate the taxation issues that you might be able to overcome in terms of different investment things and stuff like that. But I build a recruiting department. Yep. And I think, and I talked to Jeff Molson about this probably 10 years ago. Okay. Seven years ago, I brought it up to him and just to give him, because just again, to be transparent, Jeff went to St. Lawrence when I was coaching there. And and so he was part of our program. He didn't play on the team, but he was part of the program. Um, so I've known him a long time, and I, I really respect what he and his family do, not just with the Canadians, but what they do in the community. People need to know that. Yeah. You know, they, they do a whack of stuff in Montreal that they never ask anybody for any publicity. They just do it because they care about the community. Yep. And, and the other thing I would say too, Pierre, and, and it was funny, I thought of you uh, – you know, I was walking down the sidewalk when I was just up there recently. Um, and now if you go, I don't know if you saw, but at St. Catherine, once you hit Peel now, it's shut off for construction. I so it becomes a walk. Oh, I haven't seen it. Yeah. So it, it becomes a walking street. And they put up these things now, these little monuments with actual pictures, photos from all the different cup parades. And I was thinking to you, and I also thought in my head, and this is what I would sell to the player. You win here, you'll be a god for life. Yeah. You, like you have no idea what you will mean to this city. But trust me, winning here is better than winning anywhere in the league, in my opinion. And that, that's the way I would sell it because look, it was like when the Red Sox were trying to bring players in before they finally won the World Series. And they said, Hey, listen, if you can break that curse, you're never gonna buy a drink or a meal in this city again. And that's how it would be in Montreal. Um I remember one time getting in trouble and there was corporal punishment at my school. I went to lower Canada college and you were allowed to get hit with a cricket bat or a, a, an old goalie stick. I'm not kidding you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I missed school once, maybe twice, but definitely once <laughs> maybe twice. Uh, to go to a Canadians parade. And uh, my teacher at the time is a lady that's no longer living. Her name was Alice Par or Mrs. Parsons. I'm not going to say her first name, okay. Mrs. Parsons. Cause that's how much respect I had for her. And she brought me aside when she goes, you know, Pierre, that wasn't really good. You just had to ask for permission. I said, you wouldn't let me go. She goes, maybe I would have if you would have asked properly. <laughs> I learned a good lesson from her. But when she was in her 90s, I was working on television in Canada. I, had, I, my, I was out of coaching. She sent me the most magnificent letter. I'm not kidding you. 
and it was all in old script. Oh, wow. Oh, it, it blew me away. It blew me away, Jimmy. She was such a kind lady, but I learned so much from her. And one of them was to control my temper at the sports fields because she said, Pierre, you're going to do something that none of these other guys are going to do. You're going to probably make your living in sports. So you, don't pick on them. They don't have the same intention <laughs> that you do. So I remember when I was a little boy, she took me aside. I thought she was going to whack me with the paddle, but she did. And I learned a lot from her. I learned a That's lot. That's great. That's a great. Which uh, which cup was that? Do you remember? No, it would have been. Uh, I'm gonna say 71. Okay. Or 73. One of the two. So so when you broke the Bruins' hearts that year, 71. <laughs> well, 71 was. I'll never forget Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, they were down two nothing in Chicago, and Jacques Lemaire scored on Tony Esposito from center ice in Old Chicago Stadium. And then Henri Richard just went to town, and uh, Dryden was phenomenal. Kenny Dryden was great. But one of the things from that 71 Cup that I remember was, uh, you know, Stan Makita was playing for Chicago. Bobby Hull was playing for Chicago. Keith Magnuson was playing for Chicago, the late Keith Magnuson. Mm -hmm. And all these men are dead now. Tony Esposito yeah. was the goalie. I mean, you, you think about it now, and I was like, I knew I was going to be in hockey just watching that. Yeah, that's awesome. Then, that's how I was. You know, I coached in the Stanley Cup final in Old Chicago Stadium the last time it was played <laughs> there. And I, when I walked up for the first practice, Did I was thinking back to that. I was thinking back to 71. I was like, hey, that's 21 years ago. That's cool. You know, as a little boy, it was really yeah. cool. It was really cool. Yeah. That's great stuff. I've had a couple of those moments myself. Well, listen, we want to thank Jeff Gordon, Executive VP. Yes. Of well, was he great or was he great? He was yeah, unbelievable. Was a lot of good tidbits there. A lot of good stuff. Uh, want to thank our production crew there in Montreal. Finally, great to meet them, by the way, last week. It was good to meet you guys in person. Uh, and thank everyone, of course, in the in the viewers room here. And thank you, Pierre, for uh, some great fill-in work yesterday and for setting this up today. He's Pierre McGuire. I'm Jimmy Murphy. This has been another edition of the eye test on the sick podcast network. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the eye test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy on YouTube, Facebook, Google play and Apple podcasts.